This week, we will take a sort of inside-out look at dinosaurs. We will explore some of the biochemistry that happened inside of dinosaurs, their physiology, and large-scale patterns in dinosaur evolution. The dichotomy of warm-bloodedness and cold-bloodedness is introduced in science classes at an early age. We are taught that birds and mammals are warm-blooded, or endothermic, and everything else is cold-blooded, or ectothermic. We may be introduced to anomalies in this dichotomy with anecdotal examples like the fact that naked mole rats have a physiology that is more endothermic, or that some snakes that retain their eggs rather than laying them will use muscle contractions to help elevate their body temperatures when incubating their eggs. We also introduce a couple of terms that may be new to you, but will be important for envisioning the spectrum of dinosaur metabolisms. Animals that experience body temperature fluctuations are poikilothermic. The opposite of this would be maintaining a constant body temperature, and animals that do this are homeothermic. Usually, homeotherms need to be endothermic, regulating their body temperatures through metabolic means. Since poikilotherms can tolerate swings in body temperature, it makes sense that most of them are ectothermic. All animals, to some extent, generate at least some heat internally. This is because, minimally, the process of converting food to energy is an exothermic reaction. Exothermic sounds a lot like ecto and endothermic, but don't get these terms confused. Exothermic is a term for chemical reactions that release heat. The reactions that make up the metabolism of living things are quite exothermic and all involve the same basic series of molecules and reactions. Inside ourselves, and dinosaurs for that matter, the foods we consume are eventually digested and broken down into very basic nutrients, like proteins, which are transported around and used for building materials, and the part that is important to energy and heat production, sugars. These sugars are the feedstock for cellular respiration. The process of converting these consumed calories into energy that can be stored and then accessed when it is needed. Energy is stored in the form of ATP, or adenosine triphosphate. Energy is released by breaking off one of the phosphate groups, resulting in ADP, or adenosine diphosphate, which returns to the cellular respiration cycle to be recharged into ATP again. It's a molecule that is like a binary, single-use, rechargeable battery. It's ATP when it's charged with energy, and it is ADP after it has been used, and it needs recharged. Roughly half of the chemical energy generated in this cycle is released as heat, and this is the majority of the metabolic heat we are talking about being used by endothermic animals to maintain a homeothermic status. Now we have a sense of what warm-bloodedness is and how it is achieved. Knowing how to look for signs of it in dinosaurs is another matter. We know that dinosaurs fall between birds and crocodilians taxonomically. That is as close as we can narrow the taxonomic gap, though, since there is nothing more closely related to dinosaurs that is still alive. The modern representatives of these two groups have substantially different metabolisms with crocodilians being ectothermic poikilotherms and birds being endothermic homeotherms. Knowing this at least allows us to compare dinosaurs to the other two groups to see which they may be closer to. We can also compare crocodilians to other reptiles to see what characteristics might correlate with their similar metabolisms and compare birds to mammals as the other group of homeothermic endotherms, albeit an independently evolved endothermic metabolism, since birds and mammals are taxonomically quite distant. The only two groups of animals that regularly hold their legs upright enough to hold their bodies off the ground happen to be endotherms, birds and mammals. It would make sense that holding one's body up off the cold ground would be an important step in staying warm. The only two living groups that coat themselves in effective insulating integuments like feathers and fur are also birds and mammals. We know that dinosaurs had both of these traits as well, as did pterosaurs for that matter. 
Four-chambered hearts are also something that birds and mammals share, and it would seem to be a necessity for endothermy as well. Blood pressure through the pulmonary circuit that passes through the lungs has to be relatively low due to the thin-walled nature of pulmonary capillaries. Endotherms need higher blood pressure through the rest of the body, though, due to their higher demands for oxygen that come with higher metabolism. If we can find fossilized four-chambered hearts that pass broad scrutiny, we might have another strong piece of evidence suggesting that dinosaurs were endotherms. Looking inside the bones of dinosaurs, we see some features more akin to what we would find inside the bones of other reptiles. We see evidence for seasonal growth patterns, rather than the constant growth patterns we see in most birds and mammals. These seasonal growth rings are called lags, or lines of arrested growth. They correlate with seasons of slowed or halted growth, like ectotherms tend to experience during the annual cold or dry season. This may mean that even if dinosaurs had elevated metabolisms, they may not have been elevated enough to power through the cold and keep growing at a steady rate year-round. Looking even more closely inside dinosaur bones, at an atomic scale, we find another piece of evidence suggesting dinosaurs skewed toward warm-bloodedness. Measuring stable oxygen isotopes inside bones can tell us about what temperature the bone was when it was growing and incorporating oxygen into itself. We can see if dinosaurs were homeothermic and maintained a steady body temperature by comparing the oxygen isotope ratios in bones close to the body's core versus bones that were more distally located in the skeleton. Homeothermic animals tend to usually have very little variation in temperature between their extremities and their body core. Poikilothermic animals, on the other hand, usually have warmer core body temperatures relative to their extremities. We would expect the oxygen isotope ratios to be fairly close to one value regardless of where the sample was taken in a homeotherm, but we would expect variation to be observed between extremities and the core in poikilotherms. The clumping of oxygen-18 with carbon-13 is another means of measuring the temperature at which dinosaur bones grew. Lower temperatures tend to produce more bonding between oxygen-18 and carbon-13, and as temperature rises, the degree of clumping falls. This method has been correlated directly with a temperature scale, allowing us to directly measure the body temperatures of dinosaurs as if we'd gone back millions of years with a thermometer to measure it when they were alive. The temperature correlations attributed to isotope clumping have been correlated to both biological and non-biological materials. It is a property of the atoms themselves, and is therefore independent of taxonomy, allowing us to measure the temperatures at which fossil organisms lived, whether they were endotherms, ectotherms, homeotherms, or porculotherms, or even vertebrates for that matter. With such clever means of analyzing fossils, Paleontologists can begin to answer questions not just about individual dinosaurs or dinosaur species, but larger scale questions about the history of life on Earth. As long as we can find fossil organisms, we can begin to extrapolate the world around them at the time they lived. We can even start to understand what the world may have been like between data points in time as well. We can tell from where different groups of dinosaurs have been found so far how and when each major group evolved and spread across the continents they could reach. We have enough data to at least start estimating the diversity of life through time for each major dinosaur group, including when and where they were especially successful and represented by numerous species, and where they may have run into trouble finding niches to fill. While each found and identified individual dinosaur is a granular speck among all the hundreds of billions of individual dinosaurs that must have lived at one point or another during the Mesozoic, it is a speck in what is becoming a cloud of specks that takes enough shape to see patterns. We can make assumptions about the continuum of evolution between closely related species to at least know that some similar dinosaur was carrying the germline on between one point in time to the next 
even though these hypothetical species have not been found, these ghost lineages had to have consisted of at least one species in between the two closely related species separated in geologic time. Based on such assumptions, we can start to guess at how many species of dinosaurs might have existed in total, including the probable majority of species that have yet to be discovered. As best as we can tell, dinosaurs got their start in the late Triassic, in a southern portion of Pangaea. At first, they were rare and not diverse. There were few niches available for them to fill. An extinction event or two near and at the end of the Triassic gave dinosaurs the opportunity they needed to flourish. A variety of larger, non-dinosaurian reptiles were rendered extinct by these global extinctions, which is how the niches opened up to make room for dinosaurs to begin to diversify and gain a substantial ecological foothold going into the Jurassic. Through the Jurassic, the continents began to separate into two major masses, Laurasia in the northern hemisphere and Gondwana in the southern hemisphere. This breakup of the continents was perhaps another important contingency that led to dinosaurs becoming even more diverse. Separating these land masses and isolating them from one another with vast oceans essentially granted evolutionary forces two massive laboratories for experimentation, where previously there had been only one. Once populations can no longer intermingle, they can no longer intermingle their genes either. The different selective forces at play in the two different continental conglomerations resulted in the development of more species of increasingly different dinosaurs that were endemic to their respective isolated ranges. Imagine what happens on islands when species are isolated there. It takes relatively few generations before measurable change occurs in the population that survive in their new restricted and isolated range. This is why isolated islands have relatively unique collections of species living on them, often species that live nowhere else. This isolation presents a situation where high endemism has the opportunity to rapidly shape populations of organisms to fit the unique environment in which they are confined. Breaking the continents up increased the endemism that dinosaurs and all the world's terrestrial organisms for that matter were subject to and therefore increased the potential for the evolution of new species. Towards the end of the Jurassic and into the early Cretaceous, in addition to the continents beginning to break up even further into smaller chunks of land, the planet was experiencing exceptionally high temperatures. The early Cretaceous especially seems to have been hot, with relatively elevated concentrations of greenhouse gases making up a part of the atmosphere. If there were any polar ice caps at this time, they would have been quite small, and the water that would otherwise be locked up as glaciers would have been in the oceans, making them slightly deeper, which makes them cover much more land than they otherwise would cover. This too helps increase the isolation between continents, and along with it increase the opportunities for this endemism to further advance the diversity of dinosaurs. Dinosaurs and other animals were not the only organisms that were driven to explode with diversity following the Jurassic Cretaceous transition. Plants also experienced this increased endemism. We do not think of plants as being terribly mobile organisms, and imagining something that spends its whole life stuck in one place, moving around the planet, can be hard to picture. Plants are actually quite good at getting around, though, thanks to their seeds and their dispersal strategies that work to distribute them to places their species might never have gone before, with intercontinental travel becoming more difficult for even spores and evergreen cones, plants also had their chance to diversify under increasingly different and isolated conditions. This perhaps was the major driving force in the development of their greatest innovations for seed dispersal, flowers and fruits, and the angiosperms that grow them. Before about 125 million years ago, Earth was a planet without flowers, or at least without what we would classify as flowering plants. Through most of the Mesozoic fossil record, paleobotanists, the paleontologists who specialize in fossil plants, have only gymnosperms and simpler plants to study. 
Things like ferns, cycads, horsetails, and conifers make up the green portion of the landscape and provided food for all the world's terrestrial herbivores. Then, between 125 and 120 million years ago, angiosperms appeared and rapidly spread across the planet. The insects that typically interact with flowers today, providing pollination service in exchange for nectar or other treats, also appear around this time. 